Hello, everyone. My name is Francis Widdowson. I used to be a professor in the Department of Economics, Justice, and Policy Studies at Mount Royal University. Anyway, what I'm doing is I'm starting this, uh, what I call the Rational Space Disputations. And for people who haven't watched the previous episodes, what we what I'm trying to do is, is have people on who I admire or who I find their work to be interesting. And we want to hopefully dig deeper into some issues. Um, I, I'm hoping to find some areas of disagreement, not that we, we might not, but uh, that's sort of the idea is that, that, you know, people don't have to agree on everything. <laughs> like this is a problem is we have to understand as autonomous, thinkers that there's going to be points of disagreement and that shouldn't result in people turning away and, and not wanting to have the discussion. We should be able to investigate ideas without there being ill feeling and animosity and so on. So for today, today's guest is Kathleen Lowry. And Kathleen and I, I don't think we've met in person, but we've seen no, one another on a number of Zoom events, and we right. have connected through the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. And I first heard about Kathleen, I believe with uh, the controversy surrounding your uh, rem removal from an administrative post at uh, the University of Alberta. So Kathleen is a, is a professor, an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology at, uh, the University of Alberta. She's had a bit of a run in with the, I guess, what we could call quote unquote cancel culture, if we like that uh, phrase. Um, anyway, so what we want to do is we want to get into that a little bit, obviously, but we also uh, would like to talk about Kathleen's uh, work uh, itself and some of her thoughts. And then I'm going to sort of ask Kathleen questions for about an hour. And then as the disputations, uh, the format is, is that we'll turn the screens after about an hour and then Kathleen will be able to ask me questions either on things that she thinks should be elaborated upon from our previous discussion or perhaps new areas which she is interested in. So welcome to Rational Space Disputations, Kathleen. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me, Francis. And I, I just want to begin by saying, you know, how how disturbed I am about your situation and what has happened to you. And, and even more than that, how disturbed I am by how little attention it's gotten from the institutions that should really care. So like the Canadian Association of University Teachers, um, the AUP, I think the American Association of University Professors should also, because this is a North American university, I, I, I've been shocked at the lack of concern from the institutions that exist to be concerned about that. I should kind mention of thing. That, that to be fair to CAUT, uh, they are uh, involved. Uh, they, they are. Have, they, okay. Yes. Yeah, so All that, right. that's the develop, that happened about, I guess, a few weeks ago or a month ago. Um, okay. I haven't had any uh, interactions with them personally, but uh, they are, so they, they've been having discussions with my uh, faculty association, the Mount Royal Faculty Association, and this is a very good thing because they have academic freedom expertise, so Oh, this, that's fantastic, because yeah. I, at first I thought CA2 hadn't, hadn't, you know, wiggled a muscle, and I thought, well, you know, if CAUT doesn't care when a tenured professor is dismissed for um, out of favor ideas, like yeah. what does it exist for? <laughs> yeah. There's no. So, so yeah. that's a good. That's a good thing. That's terrific. Um, that's terrific. And we'll see. And I think this is this is all proceeding as it should. The big problem, and we'll I'll, I'll stop talking about my case uh, shortly, um, is you know how much should be kept quiet about things like I don't I, I would like to talk personally about everything and, and so on but I've been told you know I, sh I should be careful and not uh, talk about some things and so on so that's gonna that's a bit that's for me it's the most difficult thing but I think that in terms of the unions and everything that this is all going quite well uh, uh, okay. comparatively right. like it has not worked out well for many people but for me 
I I can't really complain too much on that front. So all right, uh, we'll, we'll get then. back to this uh, shortly. But so Kathleen, um, before we start, uh, maybe you can tell the audience a little bit about yourself, uh, perhaps what your politics are. Like I, I find that quite interesting. Uh, asking people like what, how do they consider themselves politically, and 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 a little bit about your research and and what you've been involved in academic. Okay, so I, you know, the politics question, I maybe it's it's almost impossible to answer at this juncture. I, I'm someone who has always been on the left, like a little a little junior lefty from from day. Probably my first left experience as a person was. Um, my, I'm, I'm now a dual citizen, I'm an American citizen and a Canadian citizen, but my, my father was a, a US diplomat and we were living in Jakarta, Indonesia and the, and the, um, the then Vice President Quayle came to visit Jakarta and a few American students who went to the international high school were kind of invited to meet him and I refused to go because I disapproved of the of the Bush quail. I mean, I just like I was anti Republican. So I mean, from a from a young age, I, I've been kind of good little lefty. And I think like many people who maybe are around my age, we've, we've really seen the left either go in a direction that we think is bonkers or just kind of collapse. And so I, I now find I read many more sort of right wingers. Like I would say at this, at this stage of things um, on a question like foreign policy, I think I have more in common with Pat Buchanan. <laughs> and which, you know, if you told me, uh, 20 years ago, you're you're going to agree with Pat Buchanan's foreign policy columns, I would have thought like, oh, you know, but did I have a brain injury? Like what has what is going to happen to me between now and 20 years from now? Or that the one person in the US media landscape who consistently interviews people I find interesting is Tucker Carlson, which mm. 20 years ago, Tucker Carlson, and I mean, the whole thing has changed because Tucker Carlson 20 years ago was a ludicrous joke in a bow tie. He was like this little preppy weenie um, mm. right winger who I found, you know, completely sickening. And yep. now, so so where am I politically? I, I don't really know. One of the, um, I guess, I don't know if it's been the first big one, but of course, one of the big ones has been the shift in feminism from mm. a feminism that was really centered on women's experience to a, a contemporary left feminism that, that literally says women don't exist, which mm. is to me just unrecognizable. So, but there, it's not just that, there's a, there's a series of um, issues on which I, the left now seems very authoritarian. I mean, we could, we could go yeah. into this, like yeah. I've, I've disagreed yeah. with the general mm -hmm. left attitude to sort of COVID policies. I've watched yeah. very dear left friends mm. who during the truckers convoy wanted, you know, wanted them all thrown into prison. And I, <laughs> and I felt like I, to me, yeah. this Another. looks like a working class revolt. Like I don't, the, the kind of leftism I grew up with would be on their side. I mean, I was on their side, but, but watching, yeah. So where am I politically? I, I don't know. I, I feel so, so in terms of left. Lost. So, so mm -hmm. perhaps that would be helpful because I know there's these terms are bandied about uh, quite a lot. What, what is your kind of definition or, or how do you, like, how would you characterize someone you would see being on the left? I mean, you know, I guess the simplest thing is that you're sort of on the side of the little guy, right? That, that you kind of, and you have, and you have a, a sense of the little guy at various scales. So you have a sense of the little guy, you know, one of the things that, um, or another place that I, have felt very alienated from the left is all through the kind of Black Lives Matter, um, the a lot of the sort of people of color identity politics of mm -hmm. the past, let's say decade and a half, mm -hmm. just 
I don't know, at the same time that people were supposedly very worried about police violence and um, violence against black and brown bodies, none of those movements had anything to say about the fact that we were killing people in droves in Yemen. So, mm. I mean, just, just this sort of lack of this, this sense, this lack of a sense of the little guy at various scales mm -hmm. or the connectedness between, which I, I think when I think back to, um, I mean, it's not a leftism I participated in, I was, I was a teeny kid, but when you think about 1970s left movements that were simultaneously about racism in the United States, but also had a critique of the Vietnam War, but also had a critique of the oppression of women, these kind of interconnected analyses that um, I, I just think that's really kind of gone. So with respect to the little guy, mm -hmm. so some would say that trans people are the, are the little guy, like, they're, like, like I, I, the, the little guy is a kind of an interesting kind of way of putting it because you could make yourself into a little, like I would say, you know, I'm the little guy because I'm like trying to put forth my ideas and I'm being, you know, uh, sort of trampled. But my adversaries would say, no, no, you're not the little guy because you're the one who is, you know, punching down on, uh, you know, indigenous people. Now, I don't agree with that analysis, but still. So this kind of little guy idea is that do you think right. that well i mean the other yeah. the other element of it is this um sort of complete historical and political um ignorance so mm -hmm. i think i think if you've if you've just heard if you just kind of heard of trans people right you're like well mm -hmm. they're kind of gender non-conforming and life is hard. And I, I think that's actually true, that if you, if you violate sexual stereotypes, I think life is hard. Like, I, I think that is definitely true. That's not something that trans activism, I mean, feminists figured out that out a long time ago. So if you just think of it in those immediate terms, mm. you think, oh, okay, well, I guess, I guess they, they must be the little guy. Mm. So you have, the problem is you have to do a little bit more reading. And I know this because I went through this process myself. Yes. Um, you're not the little guy if policy gets pushed through in nation after nation with zero democratic debate. You're not the little guy if every corporate entity celebrates you. You're not the little guy if in every speech, the president of the United States, the prime minister of Canada go out of their way to say how much they're on your side. You have to, and, and this has been figured out, oh, this is, um, it's because this is a victory after a history of struggle. That's, it's a lie. I mean, this is a, the politics of trans activism has completely kind of attached to itself a history that is not its own. So it is attached to itself a, a century of feminist struggle. It has attached to itself a half century of gay and lesbian struggle and is then said, showed up at the last minute and said, oh, we're like the, the final chapter of this um, century or 50 years of struggle. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just, if you actually look at the history of it, it's mm -hmm. a complete misrepresentation. So mm -hmm. feminists, of course, were not, I mean, feminists starting with the, the women's suffrage movement, they weren't thinking about trans people. They were thinking about the situation of women. Um, the, so that, and trans action has done a little bit of attaching feminist history to itself, but it's done a lot of attaching gay and lesbian history yes. to itself. Yeah. And sort of recasting, oh, mm. trans people were at the center, which consistently um, is, is either reassigning the gender identity or just rewriting history altogether. So gay and lesbian people were concerned and they, and they had a real fight on their hands and they had a real struggle that took a very long time. So from mm. say Stonewall to the, the, the first gay marriage in California, I think it was in 2008, that was, that was 30 years 
of, of hard work at kind of the, the, the coal face of political activism. Yeah, yeah. So trans I, activists and trans activists turned up, they're, they're lavishly funded. Mm. They're led by extremely wealthy white men, mm. Jennifer Pritzker, Martine Rothblatt. Yeah. They turned up at policymaking and they actually, if you've seen this Denton's document, which is a, Denton's is a law firm, their strategy was don't have public discussions of, <laughs> of gender yeah. identity I've, policy. I've come across that myself. Like this, right, is, because a people this freak, is a big part of it. People freak out if they know yeah. what it means. If you actually yeah. say what we mean by this is male rapists are in women's prisons. Yeah. People are like, wait, <laughs> I don't, yeah. I'm not for that. Where I think, you know, gays and lesbians really had the arguments and they, yeah. and they never did this no debate thing. They yeah. were like, we're going to explain to you, and they and they faced a tremendous amount of um, scorn and violence and all of those things. And, and they said, look, we're going to explain to you why it's important to have um, marriage, why it's important that we mm -hmm. can inherit, why it's important I can go to the hospital with my partner, why it's important that my, for lesbians, it was really important, why it's important that, that my ex-husband can't just go to court and say like, my ex-wife is a lesbian, so obviously she's an unfit mother, like yeah. the children to yeah. me, like all of those things. But they didn't say, they didn't sneak behind, go into the policymaking rooms, yeah. say, okay, well now the law's just passed and no debate, everyone yeah. must shut up. Yeah. That was not how, that's not how women, that's not how feminism did it. That's not how gays and lesbians did it. It is how trans activists did it. Yeah. And they did it because they are, they're rich and they're white and they got into the halls of power. They passed a bunch of law and policy changes. And then they said no debate. And yeah. then because that's a, that's so obviously something that you can only do if you're an elite yeah. is an in attached to themselves oh, we are the final incarnation of a hundred years of feminist struggle. We are the final yeah. incarnation yeah. of a half century of gay and lesbian struggle. It's just a lie. It's just a lie. So I'm, I'm thinking a couple of things related to our left, kind of getting into the left wing. What, what, mm -hmm. like, how can we determine if this is a left, left wing cause or not? Or is that, a, is that not, is that very difficult to do? Um, one of the things is is uh, class. So, what is the connection with class? Is there a connection with class? And I I've thought about trans activism, and I have a similar problem with the gay and lesbian kind of angle as well. Not to say, uh, you know, like, hey, do what you want. <laughs> like, like this is the thing is like, as a kind of a liberal having liberal values. Like, why should I care if people wanna have sexual relationships with other consenting adults. It's like, this is not a big issue, um, but I, I'm not sure if there's a connection between gay and lesbianism and class, but I certainly can't see a connection between trans activism and class. And even more, uh, uh, which is kind of something that someone has brought up with respect to the gay and lesbian versus trans activism difference is that gay and lesbian politics was about stopping people from discriminating against them and doing, th like it was like getting people out of their lives. The trans activists are going to you and saying, you must do this to support us. Like, right. like that's kind it's of extremely, the, the big kind of totalitarian kind of dynamic. Right. It's right? very authoritarian where the gay and lesbian thing, I think that's true. It's it's, you know, for using this little guy analogy again, gays and lesbians were the little guys saying like, just stop, stop doing police raids on our bars. Stop, yeah. stop asking yeah. questions about what I'm doing after hours. Stop standing in the way, don't stand in the way of, um, right, my being able to marry who I want to marry. Like just sort of get, get yeah. authority out of the way where yeah. trans activism is extremely authoritarian. Yes. Because it it you must believe the things that I assert about myself. Yes. Um, and and it's the other way that you can just see, I mean, I used this kind of sexed term, the little guy, but it, it really comes down hard on the little gal in the sense that it says to women, 
your your consent doesn't matter. I mean, it's, it's it's so oh, it's so misogynist. It says your consent doesn't matter. There's mm. going to be a man with a penis in the changing room. A woman with a penis. <laughs> right. Then it's a man, right? Like if you've got a penis, you're a man. Yes. There's going to be a man with a penis in your changing room. Yes. No, you are going to be exposed to that no one cares if you consent to it and you can't and you also you cannot object you can't say mm -hmm. i feel scared i feel that this isn't right like you're yeah. you're a bigot if you object yeah. and yeah. now the law is i mean the law in canada is literally that you're not allowed to it's just like too bad you know you don't like it too well, bad. The pronouns, i guess that's where we sort of have to applaud Jordan Peterson. I'm not sure what your, your views on Jordan Peterson are. I'm a, I'm, I admire Jordan Peterson for his freedom of expression stances. I, I'm, I'm slightly right. like, I, I'm not, I'm an atheist. So I find the, the religions kind of stuff and, and I'm a historical materialist. So I, uh, I don't, I don't accept capitalism as being a, you know, the, the best kind of economic system. But, you know, I think when he kind of rose up, he, when he identified the danger and I think it was 2016 now, that was that long ago, that this kind of demand that you use these pronouns and so on, and that being compelled speech and this having this kind of thought controlled totalitarianism, which I like, if, if he hadn't done that, I might have just thought, well, like, big deal, like, I've got to, I got to call someone they, them instead of he, she or whatever, like that, that sort of thing. I, I kind of thought it's not a big deal, but when he started to raise the alarm, that's when I thought that's true. You know, like why should I in this genetic, and it's not name. So I've heard people make that, they say, you know, you shouldn't call someone by an, another name than their name, but your name is personal. Like it, it, it's a, a pronoun is a generic English language rule that we need for common agreement and I think that was a bit of an indication that we were heading down a path that was not going to have uh, you know cons the consequences were going to have serious consequences for society right and not, and not I mean but specifically for women I mean it has really bad consequences for women so when when there's a set of policies that are particularly dangerous and damaging to women I don't know like what does feminism exist for if it doesn't exist to protest that. And I, you know, Jordan Peterson, it's interesting. I think it's great that he brought attention to this, mm. but it's, it's interesting that you think of him as an early figure because feminists have been screaming about this no, yeah. for like so, no. for so long and no one yeah. paid attention, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the kind of old fashioned rad fem sort of feminist. So there was okay. a, a woman, her, 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 moniker was gallus mag she wrote she ran a site called gender trender mm, yeah. since 2007 she was i mean she her site was taken down repeatedly yeah. she was just she like got it in the in the she had been talking about this for an age but then i mean it's this classic thing like then a man talks about it and suddenly people are like oh this is an interesting issue i jordan peterson i have really i feel like jordan peterson is like he's just not speaking to me, right? He, which is fine. Not everything has to be for me. I think Jordan Peterson has a message that is, that a lot of young men like. And I, and I think it's pretty, this whole thing about like clean your room, stop laying around masturbating, like get out there and try to have a life. <laughs> I don't, you know, it's great. Like, um, and they're not, and I think they're not going to listen. Like if I gave them that lecture, it'd be like, wah, 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 shut up, mom. Yeah. Whereas if a, if a man gives them that same lecture, mm -hmm. young men respond to it. So I, there are a lot of people who, who particularly feminists really hate Jordan Peterson because he's like kind of pro patriarchy. I don't, you know, I think like, oh, he's not, he's, he's talking to men. It's fine. Like I, he doesn't make me angry. I have tried several times to listen to really sit through one of his I don't this is so petty I don't like his voice so mm. I find his voice kind of hard to listen to but but yeah sometimes he says things that if you kind of have a formation in 
sort of the left social sciences or if you've read a lot of Marx, you just find some of the things he says sort of naive or sort of silly. And then you think, but it's not, it doesn't make me mad. I feel like mm -hmm. it's fine. Jordan Peterson yeah. is doing well, it. I, I find it interesting. People are so tricked, if we're going to use that word, triggered by mm -hmm. like, like there's people I know who have no longer friends anymore because one of them thinks Jordan Peterson has things to say. Like that's, that's, that's how extreme it is. Um, but I find what I find interesting about, and I, and I, because I don't, I'm, I'm actually at this point now where I, I, I almost want to find out, I know there's a disagreement, but I want to find out more about it. And one of the things which I think is kind of crucial now, and I, I'm not, I used to be a very anti-conservative. I used to have an anti-conservative uh, kind of stance because I, I took the liberal, I was a liberal and I thought, this kind of reliance on tradition and everything, that's all just not taking responsibility for making an intellectual decision about whether we want to go down this road or not. But the more I think about it a little bit, and I think this is where feminism, I think this is a little bit of the kind of dispute in feminism now that's kind of linked up with it is that, you know, is it, in, you know, is there the male female difference? Is it, is there actual kinds of personality and circumstances that, that are not completely aligned with sex, but have a huge overlap? And all this kinds of kind of, you know, kind of trying to sever those two, the sex and the gender. So that that's I think perhaps where we started to go down this conflict within feminism is the the demand to sever sex and gender. And then now we're just getting rid of sex altogether. Like, so like that was kind of getting us on the road to this kind of like complete um, relativism and no, was, was kind of denying the, the connection between sex and gender. Do you, right. do you like, what's your thoughts? I, on well, I mean, I haven't, this isn't a history I've studied, but I think, um, I think some, interesting things went sort of wrong with feminism in the 1970s and kind of the wrong branch of feminism made it into the academy. I think there was a, a sort of, <sighs> yeah, I'm, it's, it's hard for me, it's actually hard for me to be articulate about this, both because I, I, I wasn't really trained in women's studies. I wasn't trained mm, as a feminist, yeah. I was trained as an anthropologist. And my, my own views have changed. So mm. I feel like, again, 20 years ago, I would have said, which I still think is true, is, well, we've never, because we have a society that is shaped by sexism, we've never raised a baby in a non-sexist society to see how mm. it turns out, right? Like, yeah. let's raise a boy baby and a girl baby in a society that has no sexual stereotypes and see how they turn out. My, I, I think my feeling 20 years ago would probably be like, oh, they're just the same, right? That boys and girls, you raise them in a sex, in a sex role stereotype free society and they'll be, they'll just be, they'll just have personalities but they won't have anything or we couldn't do it with one, but let's say you raise a hundred boys and a hundred girls mm. in, a, in a magical society that's free of sexual stereotypes. And it would actually turn out that they're pretty much the same. They just have personality differences. Um, I, I'm much less persuaded of that now. I mean, I think maybe, but that's mm. probably not the way to bet, right? It's probably not the way to bet yeah. that, um, even if we had this sex role stereotype free magic planet that we would send mm. this hundred girl babies and hundred boy babies to, yeah. I think that you would probably see some trends in the boys would probably be more aggressive on the whole. The yeah. girls would probably be more interested in nurturing kind of, and, and one of the, so there's various, there's various reasons. I, I think that um, some of the, the research in Genetics. Some of the advances in genetics have been surprising. I think mm -hmm. haven't turned out. I thought they were gonna they were gonna demonstrate that much more kind of blank slatey kinds mm -hmm. of things than in fact yeah. they are turning out to demonstrate. There's yeah. also these interesting studies that in more egalitarian societies like Sweden, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. where men and women are more free to choose what they want to do. In fact, they (laughs) seem to choose to do more sex stereotypical things. It makes it actually more more, um, differentiated. And right. Then, so in yeah. the places like, you know, in say China or Soviet Russia, you had a lot of women mathematicians, but it was because that was one of the only ways you could get a good job. So, so yeah. there weren't, it wasn't yeah. like people were freely choosing. You had a lot of, so it's, so it means women can do these things that in the West are considered kind of masculine. They can do math, they can do engineering. And there are societies that demonstrate that, Yeah. but in a society that allows more choice Mm -hmm. it it seems to be the case that actually proportionally more men are interested in doing engineering and proportionally more women are interested in being kindergarten teachers and so maybe there is maybe there is a there there and i i'm I've started to think that's true. So it's hard for me to talk like, about. Yeah, that's my own. And I'm not an expert in the series, so like, but I just, but the thing that I find curious is like the, the kind of objection, like the, like, like even talking about, this is kind of interesting about this idea of thought crime, which I'm not sure if you're, uh, the Orwell, George Orwell. Right, right. It's a big, I'm a big fan of George Orwell. Anyway, he, he kind of really kind of delved into this, but when you're, when you're getting into an area that is you you can sense is slightly dangerous you have this kind of break you almost feel an, a, a psychological break that is acting upon you and that question these kinds of questions about kind of innate uh genetic kinds of bases for for behaviors is a, is an area that for many many years at least personally I, I was very resistant to like I, I would I would I would look for information that was contrary to that and so the question is why what 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 are we afraid of like what why is that why should we be surprised and opposed to the idea that there's going to be biological differences between men and women like in terms of our personalities because obviously you know thousands of years of of uh, of evolution or you know hundreds of thousands of years of evolution will make that the case uh and it's i i think there's and the, the thing of what you're talking about about the scandinavian countries and so on it's kind of wrapped up in that and our kind of what we value i guess it's about why do we value a mathematician more than we value uh a kindergarten teacher like right. that kind of thing and instead right. of instead of challenging that, we want to say no. Women should be able to should be the same percentage of mathematicians as they are kindergarten garden teachers. So that I think that's a bit of what's happening there. Right, that. totally. So I, it sounds like we've had a very similar trajectory on that. That I mm-hmm. used to sort of eagerly read things that that kind of made the case that if it were not for sexism women would enter engineering at exactly the same and like tons of men would be kindergarten teachers. And, and now I think, um, yeah, that, that, that I don't, I don't know that that would be good for anybody. <laughs> if lots of, I'm not against, there are, yeah. are going to be some men who are interested in being kindergarten teachers. Yeah. And they I should think, not, there should be no, like no right. one should prevent them. Like there shouldn't be obstacles to them becoming a kindergarten teacher if they want to become a kindergarten teacher right but we shouldn't feel like we're there's there's got to be this this proportionate representation all the time of everything and if there's not then there's something wrong like 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 we have this and that seems to me to be that it's got to do with socialization and it's got no no basis in and there that's that's to go back to not that i was kind of alive in a and as well i was alive but i wasn't in a state to participate in these debates but this was a debate back in the 70s in feminism about should we go into the academy and become women's and gender studies should we kind of enter the institutions as they are or should we stay out and keep trying to like transform society as a whole and mm-hmm. i i think I think 20 years ago, I would have said, oh, of course, you need to be in the academy, right? Because you need to, there needs to be women's studies departments, there needs to be the feminist scholarship in the academy, because otherwise, you're going to be marginalized, where, you know, if you look at where women's and gender studies are today, I Mm. think, oh, 
those 1970s feminists were right. Like this, mm -hmm. it was just, we were not going to transform the academy. The academy was going to eat us alive. And so that now I would say that the most shockingly misogynist departments are consistently women's and gender studies who, who don't, you know, male rapists in women's prisons is progress, is magnificent. Like anybody who doesn't think that's a great idea is a terrible person. Yeah. I mean, that's what women's and gender studies, uh, there's sex work is just a valid choice. And some people do sex work, sex work is work, yeah. it's awesome. Yeah, really these, these ideas that are just kind of savagely misogynist is so, now the central yeah. message of women's and gender studies. So I, I think the, the outcome has been Oh, those 1970s. So feminism gets blamed for some of, but I think there's only a particular kind of feminism that was really committed to getting into the academy. And then I think totally did respond to the reward structure of the academy, of the academy which consistently was, if you were a more radical feminist or, or if you did kind of various forms of, of what for a while I think was called difference feminism, the idea mm -hmm. that maybe women do have a, a, a different ethical sensibility than men. And there's Carol Gilligan's work, which is actually quite interesting about childhood mm. development and how um, men and women might end up with kind of different moral inferences based on girls continuing to identify with their mothers where boys have to reach a point where you like your mom, who is like your cuddle bunny when you're tiny, you have to kind of reject her at a certain point in order to become male. Mm. And this might lead to, anyway, all those kinds of things that were sort of, I think very poo-pooed by the kind of feminism that became dominant in the academy. Yeah, so feminism gets blamed for the current situation, but I think, oh, it's actually only a particular kind of feminism. Mm. But there was another kind of feminism that, uh, survived on the margins. And I think it's it's that feminism that has consistently been making the critique, for example, of trans activism. And, but can't, it's sort of running around the edges of the academy. Like I imagine it like jumping up, trying to peek in the windows and being like, look over yeah. here. We still have some ideas that you should pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I've pondered this a little bit myself about the, the these whole, these studies kinds of departments. And uh, I wonder if it was a mistake to have them segregated like that. Like, I wonder if they became more, you know, less, certainly more hostile to scholar, like, like evidence-based scholarship and the idea of scientific, you know, methodology and so on, this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If they had not, like if we had, if the demand had been made, which was, I think a legitimate demand, which is, Hey, all the subjects that people are studying in the university, you know, are not really looking at, you know, the circumstances of women, that kind of criticism, which was valid. And, and right. for many, many other, you know, not just women's studies, but all these other studies programs. And right. instead of making that demand that the other disciplines change to incorporate that more into their curriculum, we got this ghettoized kind of thing that started to happen. In, I guess started in the 60s, but we started to take hold in the 70s and the 80s. Right, which now, and it's interesting, is now very, um, the other thing that I think one wouldn't have anticipated when let's say <clears throat> women's studies, uh, black studies, Africana studies, indigenous studies, all of these sort of studies departments, I think they came in and, and I think the scholarship was more interesting when they first came in because mm. they were very sort of, they were belligerent in a way that was kind of challenging institutions. Mm. And now what's, if you, and you know this, because if you work within a university, these studies departments are typically very cozy with administration. Mm. So there's, and the administration has sort of taken on the values of these studies departments. So they've become so institutionally captured. And yeah. you can say, on the one hand, you can say like, that's great, right? They've become, this is a sign of progress. Like they, um, they are finally starting to have a bit of institutional power. But again, to go back to that little guy thing, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, but now, 
Yeah. I don't know when the women's and gender studies department or the indigenous studies department is so incredibly cozy with university administration. And the other thing that really interests university administration is um, cost cutting, destroying tenure, building more, more, I don't know, lavish centers of this and that that yeah. proliferate more and more administrators. I don't, I don't think you're really on the side of like the revolution anymore, guys. Like I, I think you've lost your way. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's not, it's maybe, well, it's definitely not my place to say that about um, other aspects of EDA, but I am a woman and I, and I can't stay it about, about woman studies that I, I think, yeah. I, I think it's, it's totally law. It's not doing, yeah. it's not doing what it said on the 10 back in 1970, which is like, yeah. we're going to come into the university and we're going to totally um challenge I mean, I guess, yeah challenge. i guess they, they have challenged it in some ways but it's it's interesting how cozy they have become yeah. with bureaucracy yeah. like they they really are like this and they demand as well these you know edi offices or as i call them di die offices like when we we're making the demand like to, to reduce the bureaucracy so this is a huge problem, which uh, I'm not sure how you feel about that, but this is something that I've been, um, and, and Camille Paglia uh, uh, talked about this problem of this bloating bureaucracy that now controls all facets of university life. And the, the die uh, ideological aspect is the one of the, the fastest growing of this kinds of areas of the administration and the women's studies kinds of programs and also the other studies and this is what i would call advocacy studies not a multidisciplinary uh, kind of thing where you 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 bring together people with experts into different things and you put them into this this is one program it's it's got much more of a, a kind of identity politics kind of dynamic that's happening within within it um you know they they're they make the demands for these these bureaucratic structures like, and that's part of that. Cozy. Right. So it's this very cozy, like, we demand more administration. Administration is delighted to grow. So they support us. So there's this symbiosis. Yeah. And I, I know I feel exactly the same way because I think it's, if you called EDI the promotion of virtue and the suppression of vice, then you couldn't, you, people would be like, oh, we can't, you know, that's very normative. We can't have that, but you call it EDI yeah. and it puts an administrator on every university committee, on every hiring committee, mm -hmm. on every promotion committee, yeah. on every research committee. Yeah. So that it means that certain kinds of research, which we desperately need, mm -hmm. which is like, do, do, do these kinds of approaches actually help people, right? Do they, are they actually, are they actually improving the lives of your yeah. average yeah. Yeah. female bear? Um, you can't, you can't, if I wanted to do a study, because you have to write, if you apply to Shirk, you have to write a first page that's like how my study is gonna be good for EDI. If your study is, well, I think trans activism is incredibly destructive to women. <laughs> I think that would be un unfundable because it would fail on EDI. And actually, I know I have to know, know that even before, like, that's kind of the scary thing is that we all know in our heads what's fundable and what's not fundable. And if you, and you know ahead of time what's not fundable, then why that research is not going to be done no matter how valid. Right. And it can even be something like I think there's many things in the world that are like let's I'm not religious but let's say the I the general idea of Christian virtue mm -hmm. which is like um forgiveness turn the other cheek those I think those are I actually think those are genuinely good values but I just because they're good values you cannot put that into the into the policies of a public university you mm -hmm. can't say well you have to like this we're also going to support Christian virtue <laughs> EDI is like that, right? So even if you think EDI yeah. is great, you just can't have that kind of prior restraint yeah. on, on 
because that's I mean that's just not what a public research university is for yeah, you're supposed like you. to like have at it and I know for example at the U of A I was I was on the committee that the EDI policies came to and I was the only faculty member to vote against them and as a result and because I'm vocal about this stuff I I've been blackballed from yeah. every university-wide committee because you because I'm I'm like the the EDI antichrist and you can't have yeah. the EDI yeah. antichrist yeah. on the committee because then immediately you have this lady who's like yeah. yeah and questions asking questions which people don't want to hear well just like creating a hostile atmosphere yeah. by the very like the 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 kind of nasty emanations I give off and and so and I think you know you can't you just can't run a university this way you just can't yeah, no, no, even no, no. even if you uh, <clears throat> but um just so i don't forget because we, we don't have them we have now 10 minutes left um okay. i wanted just to, to because we didn't just we haven't discussed your the situation that happened to you uh which is related to what we were just talking about which is the administrative coziness and the and the growing bureaucracy and so on could you just tell the audience uh, what what that situation was that happened to you with respect to uh, yeah, trans activism, largely. Okay, so I, um, for people who don't work in universities, there are these administrative positions within departments that are not very glorious. They're not, so as undergraduate programs chair, which basically, I mean, you go to some meetings, you help students figure out certain kinds of problems, but it's a very low level administrative position. And it's kind of a, um, my basic job is to be an associate professor, but within the department, somebody has to take on the role of undergraduate programs chair, but it doesn't, it, at the U of A, and I think this is probably fairly typical, you get one course release and you get an extra $3,500 a year. So that's, that's, so it's a little kind of extra duty. And I had, I had advocated for a long time that I felt that um, tenured professors should be teaching more of our low level classes. And I, I actually has started a few years ago to teach our 100 level class. But anyway, I felt like since I had been kind of a, a critic of some of our teaching policies that I should put my money where my mouth is and actually do those. So when the previous chair, their term finished, I said I would, I put my name forward and I wasn't, it wasn't like there was this enormously competitive process and they carefully selected me. Nobody else wanted to do the job. And so, so it's this kind of role. It's the kind of role, it's like housekeeping. Somebody has to do the housekeeping. I said, it's not being the department chair is a lot more work and, and some more glory, but I just want people to understand that this wasn't, it was sort of a housekeeping role within as as and it's one of the jobs that you do at some point along the way of your professorial mm -hmm. career so i said i would do this housekeeping job nobody else put their name forward so i got picked to do the housekeeping job and uh, it was for a three-year term so i'd begun my my three-year term and i I don't think anyone knew I hadn't published any academic work I published one article on feminist current at this point so they could they could have known before they appointed me that I was a turf. Um, mm. But I think the main way people knew is I had some signs on my office door about um, there's pictures of them circulating I you know they weren't anything hateful they weren't like ah oh, everybody should kick trans people in the head or anything it was more like um this there's a real conflict with women's rights mm. um why this this seems like it's mostly a men's rights activism movement this is really uh this is a movement that is um instead of criticizing sexual stereotypes it's really kind of setting them in stone like oh it's a little boy who likes to wear tutus and have tea parties he's probably a girl which mm. i which is so regressive versus saying like boys can like all kinds of different things or like she's a little girl who prefers soccer to playing with dollies oh my gosh she must really be a little boy which i think is just such a regressive so stuff like that that was just pointing out yeah. this is regressive this is misogynist this has costs for women because the kinds of things that trans activists ask for it's like men in women's prisons men in women's sports the the other the the other set of demands doesn't happen right there's not there's not women going into men's sports they're not women going into men's prisons so it's something that that 
only makes demands of women, if there's something that only makes demands of women, guess what? It's sexist. So the, there were signs that said stuff like that. So they, they were not signs that were hateful. They were, but they were signs that were strong-minded, right? Mm -hmm. On my, on my office doors. So um, I don't believe it was students in any of my classes, but I, I had to lead an honor seminar for upper level undergraduates. Mm. And in the honors seminar, um, they give you drafts of their honors thesis. And I think a couple of them were kind of upset by my, my feedback. Like in one case, there was a student who was using um, the book Braiding Sweetgrass to talk about uh, contemporary, I don't know, I, I said, look, I think you're being you're, you're kind of putting together this, you're looking in archeological context and you're suggesting that things that you know from interviewing indigenous people today can be directly applied to something that happened a thousand years ago, maybe, but you have to be a bit careful because you wouldn't interview French people today and say that you really understood what life was like in, in France in the year 1022, right? And so, and I do think there's a, there can be a bit of that, right? Like, oh, I've been inter interviewed a contemporary indigenous person and now I understand like exactly what indigenous people were thinking at my archeological site that's a thousand years old. Yeah. So I said, look, I, I think that you have to be a bit careful about that. And then another student was talking about um, the Venezuelan diaspora in Canada and was comparing experiences of discrimination to what Ven the Venezuelan diaspora is, was facing in like Brazil and Peru. And I said, look, you know, I'm not doubting that Venezuelans maybe face some discrimination in Alberta, but but you should be mindful of the fact that the Venezuelans who come to Alberta um, are mostly petroleum engineers. They're mostly white, like they're they're very elite, right? right. And the Venezuelans who are leaving Venezuela and turning up in Brazil and Peru, they're poor. They're non-white, so the experiences they're facing are probably not exactly like. So the, but I mean, these are kinds of um, these kinds of uh, where you're saying I don't think because you you're familiar these kinds of very grand claims about indigenous identity or like Venezuelan identity. And mm. I was like, I'm not sure white Venezuelan petroleum engineers in Alberta actually do face the same hardships as black Venezuelan refugees in a flowing across the border in Brazil and Peru. Okay, so I was making those kinds of points, but I, I think students got a little, a little, you know, got their hackles up. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, and this lady that we're pissed off at is a turf. Oh, and the other thing, the other <laughs> thing that I did is, is um, I was also, as part of this job, I said, I would lead a graduate seminar that they just needed somebody to, and I, um, I did some stuff on academic publishing, which I also think weirdly, in some disciplines, they're, they're very, they make no bones about academic publishing, but I think anthropology is one of the disciplines that is sometimes a little, they don't really want to talk about stuff like um, journal citation rates, because <laughs> our numbers are so low, right? So we never look very good on journal site. Like the best anthropology journal, I think it's, 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 it's like it's average article is cited like twice, right? Which is very different from like chemistry or whatever. So, but I just said like, you guys should, as graduate students, you should understand what these things are. I, I, I privately suspect that some supervisors were a little mad about me just explaining to graduate students how you look this stuff up because then of course you could immediately look up your own supervisor and find out that actually our and I, I'm not even saying that we're a terrible department I'm just saying anthropology as a whole mm. our citation rates are like not mm. and but just I think just being a bit clear on that I think some people were a little pissed off at me for other reasons and mm. then it was like oh and it turns out this lady that we don't like is a turf, right? <laughs> so then, um, so, so they started going to administrators to say like, we don't feel safe. Like this person doesn't make us 
like she makes us feel very unsafe and she shouldn't be undergraduate programs chair because this creates a hostile atmosphere and people don't. So from what I gather, um, the on the administrative side, they were trying to get students to make formal complaints to say mm. like, okay, say something that she did, right? Like a bad thing that she did because yeah. we actually, I mean, I think they did the administration I think they did understand, like you can't, you can't just say, well, she has an idea that we don't like, so you need yeah, to fire yeah. her. No, which I no. think the students, and I think there's this interesting way in which students, because they hear all this stuff about inclusion and safety and blah, blah, blah. I think the students were genuinely puzzled. They were like, but we're telling you this lady has bad ideas and makes yeah, us yeah, feel unsafe. Yeah. Like, yeah. So this is an open and shut case, right? And I, the administration was a little bit like, I think, <laughs> I think kind of got trapped in their own rhetoric of like, yeah. oh, of course we want you to feel safe. Yeah. And of course we we think that, um, I don't know if they thought TERFs is, because I eventually ended up having a conversation with the Dean and I said something about TERFs and she was like, what's a TERF? Yeah. So she didn't even yeah. know. She didn't even she, know that story. That she, didn't, so she sort of didn't know. And for, for our audience members, for people who don't know, uh, right. It means uh, trans exclusionary radical feminist, which, as far as I understand it, this is not, this is seen as being a slur by a, a particular segment right. of feminism because it's not about excluding mm -hmm. trans people, it's excluding, uh, you know, people with penises uh, from men, men. We can just say men. Like, we don't have to say people with penis. We can say the word men. Well, I, I'm doing that word. amusing. Right. I, I, okay, I, but I'm, I'm going to say, right. I find to be amusing, and I can't help myself because. Right, but that's exactly people. right. We're not trans exclusionary because, you know, men don't belong in women's spaces. No. But if there are women who identify as trans, like we, they're, they're women. Like They can go into yeah. space. Like, right. you're not they exclu can excluding you know trans people xx trans people xx chromosome trans people from women's washrooms like this is i mean i prefer, okay so francis you yeah. can use but my language is where we think men should be out of women's spaces and we think women are welcome in women's spaces like it's not it's not complicated yeah, yeah. And so and from my based, perspective it's sex anyway, based as opposed to uh, right sex based yeah. so okay so but i i think so i think the administration then there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff where they're trying to get the students to make a formal complaint. Mm. <laughs> and the students, the students feel puzzled by this because yeah. they're like, we are making a formal complaint. Yeah, and then, yeah. but the content of the formal complaint is yeah. she has ideas that make us feel unsafe. And the university is like, ah, oh, that's, I mean, despite all that we say, that's actually not, <laughs> it's not like a fireable. So then I think they were, there was really a lot of behind the scenes stuff of like trying to find something that I had done, right? So, so this stuff. And I think, I don't know, but I think the university was basically like, yeah, but none of that stuff actually is like, we mm -hmm. can't have a disciplinary hearing about that yeah, yeah. because asking you to look for more citations for your paper, yeah, professors are allowed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, yeah. and you, and you being unhappy about that. Yeah. Yeah. Prof that's, that's kind of okay. So they couldn't, so they couldn't get something and I would have welcomed like a real disciplinary hearing, but I think yeah. on the administrative side, they realized they didn't have anything. <laughs> no, I don't think you should be so quick to want that, Kathleen. Though. Like, I well, maybe not, but I just think the university was like, there's nothing here that we can actually call a disciplinary no. hearing about, yeah. but the students are like unhappy, 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 unhappy. And so the first meeting was my department chair called me in and it was clear that she kind of wanted me to resign for the good of the department. Mm. And I said, well, look, this feels like McCarthyism to me, mm -hmm. right? That basically like you're a communist, this is yeah. bad for the department's yeah. reputation. So I was like, you can fire me, yeah. but I'm not gonna throw yeah. myself on the pyre. Yeah. So then I got called into the meeting with the Dean who didn't even know what a turf was. And we had kind of a good conversation, but then a few days later, they sent me a note that just said, we're relieving you of the position because we think you can no longer be effective in the role. Uh, and I said, could you just specify like yeah. what was not effective? Yeah. yeah. And no. So Thanks. I think they, you know, and the 
position of the university. So my my faculty union actually is pursuing a grievance. Oh, good. The position of the university is we're allowed to, to dismiss you for any reason, and we don't have to explain yeah. what yeah. it is. Yeah. And the and the the counter argument I think basically is service is part of the role. So actually, service is protected in the same way that research and teaching is protected. Mm -hmm. Like she can mm -hmm. have bad ideas. Yeah ideas in quotes yeah. yeah and still perform service so that's and the we'll we'll have a there's going to be a hearing about it in may as you oh, know these things take a long yeah, time yeah yeah they do but so, that's good and, that the union because sometimes unions will say you know because service is, is sort of a voluntary thing and so on it it's not really up to like it's not we're not we're not going to devote the time uh to 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 deal with it uh, like i'm not sure if you know about the, the case of daniel page but uh, he's a computer scientist from uh, Regina. Anyway, he got this terrible treatment by the administration concerning an innocuous comment that he made about a policy, and it wasn't even, and, and the union refused to take it forward because they said, well, it, because it's this kind of ladder type thing, it's not, it hasn't resulted in an actual thing, but you know, the union should be much more proactive about these things because oh, it's, I totally... like a creep. it's a complete creep of these kinds of incursions into your, you know, either private life or to like your legitimate professional activities and so on. So that's great that the union is. Well, I, the reunion, I would actually say was quite reluctant yes. to, at first they were supportive <laughs> and then they were reluctant. Yeah. And then I did. So I, I, um, they said I couldn't look at any of their legal advice Ugh. unless I promised not to speak about any of it, oh, which yeah. I, so I said at first that I didn't want to look at their legal advice because I did want to speak about it. Mm. So, so I didn't want to see their legal advice. Mm. And I think that freaked them out a little because they expected me to immediately want to see the legal advice, agree never to speak publicly. Yeah. And so I said, okay, I don't want to look at the legal advice that, because they said we got legal advice that says we shouldn't support your grievance. And I said, okay, don't show it to me, but I'm going to go talk about this. Yeah. And then they were like, oh. we have thought about it and we think actually we will support. And then I saw their legal advice and I can't, I, I did agree not to talk about it, but I would say the legal advice was really terrible, like yeah. really miss, like really misunderstood. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing I can say that it said was it said that I was very cheeky not to expect discipline in my job. And I said, but the thing is, I didn't get discipline. Like no. we, we, have dis we have disciplinary processes and they didn't subject me to one. So I would have welcomed you yeah. know, a real disciplinary hearing, but that's the university, because I think the university knew I hadn't done anything wrong. I just had had bad ideas. Yeah. So anyway, okay, I know this, the first hour or so. Do you so uh, yeah, so on the question of discipline. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, okay, so uh, we've now had uh, my time, so now it's Kathleen's to uh, take over the helm and uh, ask whatever it is that she would like uh, to find out about me or my work or my situation, etc. Okay, I guess, let me, um, I really, I am interested in this question of rents, but let's get there. First, I do want to ask you, I'll ask you, let me give you a choice of two questions. Okay. So the choice of two questions about your situation, one would be, um, what do you think institutions should be doing that they're not doing, whether the institution is university or faculty unions or um, kind of institutional academia, do you think it's it's handling a case like yours just the way it should, or is it kind of not handling it? What should it be doing differently? And I guess the second very general question would be, what's, do you have a grand theory of what's going on right now in terms of the kinds of things students are asking for? Because I think the kinds of things students are asking for and that faculty are on board for in terms of enforcing ideological compliance, mm. I think, I think is, is very different from the situation in say the 19, even the nineties, you know? So do mm. you have a grand theory of like, why we're, why, why are we in a moment where someone like you mm. who 
even if people think your views are very objectionable, mm. I think even people who find your views objectionable couldn't possibly think they're as objectionable as say the views of Philippe Rushton were. And Philippe Rushton was defended by, you know, he's, he was protected by academic freedom. He was defended by the various kinds of, so the, the institutions kind of, in my view, sort of did their job around Philippe Rushton, mm. right? So why are we in a moment where I guess some people would say because we've progressed so far that not only would we not tolerate a Philippe Rushton, we've advanced to the point where we won't even tolerate a Francis Whittison. So that would that would be one vision. One vision would be like we're better yeah. and better every day in every way. Yeah. If you don't agree with that vision, do you have a grand theory of, of what's going on? Like why is this happening? Yeah. And and what should yeah. the response be? Yeah. Well, I'm uh so I won't do the first one just because like <laughs> okay. um well, I, I, I'm, I'm on the one hand, I, I want to applaud the union and, and everything because like, I know things have gone really sideways with other people and, and my union is one of the best in Canada. That's not to say there aren't serious problems and, and it's a little bit similar to you. A lot of there's, you know, have to be managed very well. And I don't want to, you know, diss them when, you know, uh, you know, I think they're doing a good job generally. Um, the second one, though, is a very uh, is an area of what I'm working on right now. So uh, I'm currently working on a manuscript called the Woke Academy, uh, which is looking at advocacy studies. And this is kind of a little bit of the conversation we we're having earlier, which is how um, the it started with black studies in the 60s and then women's studies and then queer studies and then disability studies and so on. Um, they're kind of position from a kind of a ghetto, like a like segregated, very marginal kind of entity to them actually to some extent taking over the machinery uh, of the university, uh, which happened, it seems to have happened in around uh, 2010, I guess. That, that's when you really started to notice it. And you would see, um, you know, you'd see diversity offices and this kind of thing. Like, like that was, um, that was uh, unusual, like, 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 like the bureaucratic infrastructure was unusual. Um, I'm just going to, oh, my office is just like, get, I get the sun coming in and- Yeah, I was noticing you were getting a bit washed I know, out. I'm getting more yeah. and more, like a glow. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so, so this, this kind of, and I think uh, there's a book by Helen Bluckrose and James Lindsay, uh, Cynical Theories, which, does the first attempt, and it's it's. I'm I'm kind of working through that book a little bit to see what I agree with and what I don't agree with, but this kind of traces out that kind of general uh, uh, three step process. And that's not to say that universe universities had problems in the in the past with um, McCarthyism, which you mentioned, which was a huge problem, and then religion. I guess religion was kind of the problem before that. Like uh, was control of things according to ideological uh, uh, positions. So I think people are who are watching this are, are in agreement that things are not well, things are not going well at the university. The, things are starting to unravel. Um, the question is why why is this happening? And um, my own, theoretical position, which I'm, I'm still kind of tentative on because I think it's a complex issue. And there's a lot of stuff being written on this. Jonathan Haidt is a good example, safetyism, this kind of stuff. Um, Douglas Murray, the badness of crowds, uh, Campbell and Manning, the victimhood culture, these sorts of things. But but I think it, it has to do with capitalism. So I think uh, from a, a political economy perspective, which is my kind of theoretical area, uh, capitalism is going through a number of stages. Capitalism is in its, I think down, it's on, in its down, uh, downward trajectory. It's going on the downside of the trajectory. And this then it needs to keep try to keep itself going like the system is tries to keep itself going and i think one of the things that it's done 
is it's diverted attention from class politics into um, identity politics. Uh, and I think this is why identity politics, and, and if you look at identity politics, you see it does have a, and you've identified this yourself, has a real corporate uh, kind of character to it. <laughs> like that's kind of this, right? Like why are, you know, all these corporations, you know, doing this? And, and I think trans activism is like the tip of the iceberg of this kind of identity politics, kind of corporatization, getting everyone to focus on this, which is quite bizarre if you think about it. Like, like I heard about trans activism when I was in grad school, I think it was around 2002 or something like that, or like, like early 2000s. And, and I was going, this is kind of strange. Um, and then now it's just, it's infusing everything. Like, I, I, and it's become this like, it's been it's it's impossible and it's the, the totalitarianism surrounding it is is the strongest maybe that's that's to some extent being uh challenged a bit like there's some challenges but still um as both you and i have seen although yours it sounded like that was kind of brought in after the fact um it's definitely at one of the rails that if you touch i should mention as well is that i uh because you mentioned philippe rushton you know, I still, I think Philippe Rushton, uh, although I never knew him, I, I, I think he was a serious scholar and, and I, I, I defend Philippe Rushton. I, I don't know the ins and outs of it because I don't, uh, it's not my research, but I think that area too is, is a toxic kind of area. And even to just hint at any kind of, you know, maybe there's something to that view, like maybe there's some truth to it like I and I can't speak well, to it. I haven't I haven't read I mean the accounts I've read of <clears throat> Philippe Russian series I think they do sound pretty crazy I mean he has this thing about about what is it like like different different human races are kind of differently selected in terms of they're sort of some of them are case selected and some of them are, are selected like some of them have lots yeah. of offspring that they don't care for and some of them only have a few offspring that they do <laughs> care for I mean I, at least sounds pretty bonkers to me um, but <clears throat> i would defend philippe rushton yeah not not on the grounds that that the i mean unless that's a misrepresentation of his theory which i actually think is like deeply racist and also crazy the, uh, the once you have tenure the point of tenure is you're allowed to pursue things that other people might consider bonkers i mean that's the whole and most people don't right yeah. most people do I mean, you know, there's all kinds of one thing is most people do pretty pedestrian sorts of research throughout their career. Most research is not earth shaking or groundbreaking, but you you create this ecosystem mm. in which amazing new discoveries can flourish. There's a lot of there's a lot of undergrowth. It's not not yeah. very interesting, not doing much of anything, um, just sort of repeating or confirming ideas that we already have. And then every now and then you get the fluorescence of something amazing. Yeah. But the price you pay for that is you also have to tolerate some really weird yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think I think Philippe Rushton, my understanding is is it was the weird shit. But that's you know that's just I think that's there's some there's some areas though uh, from some of my colleagues in psychology, and and this maybe, is maybe he did another, other stuff. I only know world. about the case selected, um, R selected, yeah. and the case selected, no, R selected. And, and thing like does again, sound crazy. It's sort of like a like it's a there's people who have these theoretical positions some of it is stronger some of it is weaker whatever we have to kind of sort through all that and it's very very difficult um but in the case of someone like philippe russian who is from what i understand arguing that there's some genetic basis for uh differential circumstances of of um ethnicity i guess i don't i don't even know for me the concept of race is a very murky kind of thing that i don't i don't understand very well so um but i'm just saying that whole area that he was investigating is now completely off limits like well no i'm not even sure that's true i mean i th i think now kind of the study of sort of um ancestral population genetics and how it affects current mm. 
uh, <laughs> let's say, phenotypes behavior. I actually think that's a, a hot and really interesting area. Mm. I, I think my understanding of Philippe Rushton's ideas, he was writing long before we had, you know, pretty the kind of good genetic studies yeah. that we have nowadays. Yeah. But maybe there was more to his work than the case selected, our selected stuff. The case selected, our selected stuff to me sounds well, I think there was a lot more both, to it. Both racist like, and whatever. crazy. Like, I think that both you and I agree. This um, is kind of, I, like I'm, I'm reluctant to, to even go into it because I don't, it's like one of those things I don't know enough about. Right. Even but I, maybe, maybe fully and brushing. Me, just to, to kind of like, I, I am not interested in race at all. Like I, I have no interest in that. I think we've got a hard enough time with the cultural kind of characteristics and looking at culture which i don't think is very controversial like i think that's what you're sort of alluding to earlier is that you know culture is learned behavior so um you know we can all agree that you know burning witches at the stake 500 years ago which was or whenever that was like probably longer in european culture was a terrible thing that should never happen again like like that's and that was rooted in christian beliefs and so on as well you know so so like we change it so we're no longer you know so like there, i don't see that as being controversial but um but it's impossible to talk about cultural evolution well it i was doing it um and it got like that was one of my the, the basis of my downfall uh, is that i insisted on talking about cultural evolution in context that people didn't want, didn't thought, didn't think that that should be raised, uh, and and specifically it had to do with knowledge, the evolution of knowledge, uh, which is was not allowed, and well, it, it was it was part of the reasons why I was I was pushed out of the university. Mm -hmm. So that that that. Um, in terms of the universities, we have uh, all sorts of areas now that people are very aware that if they go too much into this particular along this path, they're going to suffer consequences. Like, uh, uh, and and they might not be as severe as termination, um, but they're it's going to it's coming. It's it's and well, my case is the not the first, but probably the most well-documented case of a, of a purge uh, mm -hmm. that's happened. Uh, so I think anyone who's concerned about academic freedom at all should be, even if they think I'm like, whatever, I'm, I'm, an, uh, I'm a crank or I'm a quack or whatever. Right, even if they think you're <laughs> wrong, that's, that you, you cannot have, you can't have a prior idea of, well, these are the 10 ideas that we think are correct. And the university yeah. studies those 10 ideas. Yeah. That's that's not a university. If oh. you're generating new knowledge, whether people think you're right or you're wrong, yeah. you you have tenure yeah. and you and you generally don't, I mean, people act as if, oh, but then we might have someone who's studying like astrology or something. Mm -hmm. They think, well, you couldn't get tenure studying astrology, but if you've gotten tenure mm -hmm. and then you decide you want to study astrology actually you're allowed because so. that's my own right. and right. I, I struggle with this because you know as i was, I was talking to mark mercer about this in a couple episodes ago you know like we we want to have some quality control <laughs> we want to have some quality control in the universities and not just have it be you know someone's opinion and so on but we had these processes in place someone now has had a change of heart because they they truthfully believe that this is now there is some uh, uh, astrological kind of right right they're like something. actually i'm going to do a survey and, and it and turns out that like yeah. we have to we should not be canceling that person the university is going to have to figure out a way i think in a you know out of ethics and so on we should maybe organize some events to have like exchange of view like we need to kind of perhaps take a proactive approach and trying to bring out these points of contention more as to what you know why is it that this person who was an ast astronomer now 
is an astrologist. Like what, what were the things that led this person to do that? Like that, that should be much more the intellectual kind of response than, oh, you know, and, and I guess Anthony Hall was, was the case that, that, I'm not sure if you know the case of Anthony Hall. Is but, he the ESP guy? Uh, no, he was a 9-11 truther. So, okay, right. But even that, I mean, I think, I yeah, think, and then like, like, he, like, whatever. And then he got into trouble because he attributed 9 11, I believe. I, I haven't followed his work, but uh, according to Paul Deminitz, who was defending him, um, he said that it was Mossad, uh, Israeli uh, intelligence that had brought, had brought about 9 11, um, which, you know, I think is a highly unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> right, Scenario, but you, you just have to let people do their thing. I mean, that's what tenure is. Tenure is you let people do their thing. Yeah, that's you we... get. I think you probably get more cranks than you get genius ideas. But it's also, I think, the yeah. only way you get genius ideas that you let. Yeah. yeah. You let people like people complain about there being a lot of dead deadwood with tenure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there there definitely is more deadwood than there <laughs> are. Then there is the guy who's like quietly working for 10 years, publishing nothing, mm. and then has an, you know, a new theory of everything that's amazing. Yeah. You're right. It's, it's definitely a valid critique that you get more of the deadwood than you get that guy. Yeah. You get more of the cranks than you get somebody who is sort of outside the mainstream, but is actually right. So you get more of the wacky stuff. Mm. The problem is you, you can't, you don't know or sometimes you do know, but I think if you're too confident that you know in advance which one is which, mm. you really, I mean, it, it's just not gonna work. So yeah. I, I, and I, it worries me a lot that my colleagues really seem unable to grasp this. <laughs> like that they seem to unable to grasp yeah. Yeah. what the point of tenure actually is. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, this is this, there are, and I'm not sure what the numbers are here. In, mm -hmm. in my case, there's about 50 professors who are like, not like there's 20 hardcore, and then there's 30 that are of similar kind of thing, which is they think that some ideas should not be discussed in a university. That's their position. And I, I can't accept that. Like all ideas, even the most like, like the ones that probably we're never going to discuss because like, why would we? It's like, but the, the, so the answer to these, these crazy ideas and whatever is not to have a ban on discussing them, you know, like, and, and, and I, I, I used to be, you know, 30 years ago, so on, you know, certain ideas, you know, that's obviously beyond the pale no one should like it should never like that's not going to work because you can see that that there's like gray areas like that that's one of the problems so like in my case uh you know there's there's and i'm not even i as i said i i thought i was number 10 on the top 10 list in terms of contra controversial ideas i think i'm about higher than that now but um i i don't think my ideas are particularly you know out there um but because now I'm like, I'm closer to what some people think. I, I don't know what they're thinking that I'm actually arguing, but they, they think that maybe I'm a Philippe Rushton or something like that. Like, that's my argument, which I'm not at all. Like, I'm totally, not that I'm trying to say Philippe Rushton doesn't, shouldn't be investigating mm -hmm. things, but I don't, I'm, I'm not looking at the racial angle at all. Right, I mean, right. But I'm just, yeah, I, it just concerns me that, that it seems like at the time, at the time that people found Philippe Rushton very objectionable, mm. I think rightly, but they didn't, it was like, well, he has tenure, so you, you gotta leave him alone. Yeah. And and I do think um if if tenure is not for that, mm. there's no point in having it. No. I mean, if it's if it's not for that, it's mm. it's not meant to be like a job security. I mean, it is a job security thing, but that's not its basic. No, no. Um it is it, that you you sh should be free to go wherever the evidence leads you, right. no matter what the conclusion is going to be. So right. we, we need to, and that's how, that was the bargain that I entered into in 2008 with Mount Royal University. 
is I actually I didn't I didn't really censor myself at all. Uh, you know, maybe an odd thing here and there, but I argued what I thought was true, and I didn't I didn't have any qualms about it, because in the beginning Mount Royal was very very supportive of that, even when they disagreed with me and and were were trying to get their indigenization stuff off the ground. Um, like I remember uh, Albert Howard and I, when we wrote Disrobing the Aboriginal Industry, uh, that book was nominated for the Donner Prize. It was shortlisted for the Donner Prize. And there was, I think, four other books or whatever. And it was quite a big deal. Mm -hmm. And Mount Royal wouldn't advertise it. Oh, really? So even then? Because but, but that but because they, they didn't they were trying to do their it was very unpopular, the book was in the university, and there's a lot of anger about it. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to get their indigenization thing off the ground. Uh, and they didn't want to be promoting that. Like and, and at the time I thought it's up to them, it's up to the university what they want. I can't expect the university to promote <laughs> what did I do? Like. I'm happy with them just protecting me and they are protecting me very well, mm -hmm. right? So, so I can't, like, I can't, they don't, they don't promote everyone so, or they don't celebrate everyone. You can't celebrate everyone and they've chosen not to celebrate me, which I, I'm, I'm fine with. And then they, and they funded events that I did and everything. So that, that's fine, like, great. Um, but then, you know, in 2015, things, the protection started to, to deteriorate uh, and then in in 2020 it was completely destroyed uh, you know which i think although mount royal is a is a particular case I, I don't think it's dissimilar from generally what's happening across the country oh right no there's there's this real um you know i i did read disrobing the aboriginal industry and i didn't i didn't agree with all of it but i a lot of what you said was just so recognizable i mean i'd worked with indigenous people in in South America, so the context is different, but but yeah, you were you were making many of your observations were just I thought spot on. Mm. Um, to take a case that I think probably neither of us would be comfortable with at all. Did you hear about the 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 woman who I think she she's non-binary, but she published a book about what she calls minor attracted persons, which is. This <laughs> very, and I think I think that's a disgusting term. I think it I think it's meant to kind of normalize child sexual abuse. Nevertheless, mm. I think you know she should have a long career defending her stupid, disgusting ideas. Yeah. I I was horrified yeah. that her university dropped her. She was untenured. Yeah. They dropped her like a hot potato. Yeah. And I think you. I mean, you know, you can't do that. You can't. No, that's no. because. And because that's I kind think, of like a scary, like, and, and, right. and you can start to see, and actually I was going to raise that example, but I decided not to, because I thought it was going to be too. No, I mean, there's, uh, there's that's, maybe. That's true. Like it is, this is one of the pernicious ideas that exists in my view, is that I, I don't think there's, I, I, I really, I, I think that it's abuse. Uh, right. Of, I think this is, I, I even object to that phrase, minor yeah. attracted person. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. I think that's trying to normalize abuse. I just think the whole yeah. thing yeah. is so wrongheaded, yeah. morally appalling. Yeah. Nevertheless, the university should have said, look, this is what she does her research on. She's allowed to write books. You don't have to be her friend. No. <laughs> you no. can, you can publish scathing critiques of her work and you should and she should be forced to defend her gross yeah. work. Yeah. But you you cannot fire her. I no. mean, this so so yeah, I I it's I think it's very um so I don't know, we could we could I just I'm keeping an eye on time. I wanna at least we can keep talking yes. about this, but I, no, I wanted no, to that's good. I think we've you know, I think this is there's gonna be lots more discussions about my situation. So I I don't I think that's you know that that's right. some interesting things. I think that you and I share a lot of common ground on right, right. And, and one do, one could one one can think that my views are disgusting and despicable and all the other adjectives. I personally don't think that they have an understanding of what I'm talking about for them to say that. Um, right. But even if they do, then I should not have been fired. Uh, 
Yeah, well, like yeah, I mean, it's, it's, and, and I've been shocked that, I mean, of course, maybe people, it's not like I've written a thousand op-eds about your case. So maybe people are more upset, but I've been surprised not to see a more vocal outcry because just really, I mean, you were, you were sacked for having unpopular ideas and, and that's, I don't, you know, that's that's yeah. that's not well, I should I should uh, just say it's it's slightly more complicated than that because it, it involves kinds of definitions of harassment and these kinds of things so so that's all hopefully going to come out in the future but um, right but there's all these is... kinds of like difficult things that you know when you like what is social in social media is that work uh, if you're defending yourself on social media against someone who's trying to get you fired and you, you say a slightly, you know, colorful thing, or you do something which they is directed at them, uh, is that her harassment, like all these kinds of things. Um, and, and that's kind of the, cause it certainly the, 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 the stage was set because people were going after me because of my ideas and, and I was I was kind of encountering a, a very poisoned work environment because of it but in terms of the big picture um, there were a number of other factors which um, is, right is, but I I do think but I think you know, I think that, that like if I hadn't had the ideas that I did and, and I wouldn't I, I wouldn't have had people try to get me fired and then people trying to get me fired then then move things into an, a, another level, uh, which were like, you know, interactions of various kinds. Right. But the kind of the rough and tumble of scholarly critique traditionally, like people say terrible things about one another. I know. If, if, about things that are not even controversial. Like if you're if your views of like the English corn laws are wrong, then you're just a, a total <laughs> idiot who can barely get yourself dressed in the morning, or you know, like these things that are just that's 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 yeah. sort of standard um even about things that no one yes. outside of a tiny you know you happen to be a historian of 18th century england or something yeah. but they yeah. but people become incredibly so to suddenly say that's out of bounds but actually i really i wanted because of this is something that i'm interested yep. in yep. um i wrote an article in 2008 uh, I had done my my field work in an indigenous community in Bolivia, in which the the community was involved in both managing a national park, and in a traditional medicine project. Mm. And I I I use the idea of rents that that what they were the people who were involved in these projects, they they were very interested in the possibility of of earning a cash income on this basis, and the and the kind of cash income they were earning was clearly a rent because it wasn't it wasn't wages and it wasn't profits like it wasn't like there was a factory for producing mm -hmm. the natural landscape it was it was a rent on a kind of a, in one case a natural feature of the land which is they happen to live next to this natural area so if, if you use marx's idea of like if you happen to own a piece of property that has a waterfall on it and you can make a mill like that's that's you're yep. just getting a rent on a natural feature of the land. Mm -hmm. And then the other was um, <clears throat> the idea that uh, the traditional medicine was based not directly, but indirectly on traditional knowledge so that they, they made an argument for, it actually turned out that this kind of rent didn't work very well for them because in order to capture that kind of copyrightable rent, you actually have to be able to pay to, afford to pay patent lawyers and fight off all comers and they just didn't have the money to do that but yeah. but the hope was that they were going to be able to sort of you know have a, some kind of a patent or trademark on this bit of knowledge and earn a rent on it so i had been thinking about this rent idea so i was interested to see it appear in your most recent book yeah. about separate but unequal but when a, a place i would I don't know if challenge you or or something you have this framework in which you say well um canada's indigenous people have kind of leapt from one sort of cultural evolutionary stage to another and and they they haven't gone through the steps and so they're sort of living off rents 
where really what they should be encouraged to do is sort of enter the traditional economy, like become wage workers of some kind, that this would be better for them to like enter at a different sort of, sort of be brought along in evolutionary stages from the stage of hunter gatherer to the stage of proletarian, more mm -hmm. or less. Yeah. And I, um, I can see why, even though you, you explain why you think it's not insulting, I can, I can see why people find it insulting to be called like a child in the cultural evolutionary hierarchy, just because it, it sort of assumes, well, one, one reason would be that it assumes that a child only grows into an adult, right? There's only one thing a child is going to turn into. A child doesn't turn into an oak tree or a giraffe, where I think one of the problems with cultural evolutionary schemes is they are very teleological and they assume that everybody's on the same trajectory so that everybody's going to end up kind of civilized, where I think we don't know that, right? We don't know, we don't know what direction Aboriginal Canadian culture was headed or, or different Aboriginal Canadian cultures. We don't know where they would have ended up had they been left alone, right? It might have turned into, uh, uh, so, so yeah, like I, I think there's all kinds of, there are real differences in different cultural trajectories. So like the Inca empire, on the one hand, it looks like other empires and states, but there's features of it that are unique. So that it doesn't, I think this, this kind of cultural evolutionary stage thing doesn't give enough room for the fact that people can be headed in different directions to go and do different things. So that's, mm -hmm. but the thing that I'm, I, I really would like to ask you about is, I think that the fact that um, indig Canadian indigenous communities are getting involved in a kind of rentier economy, mm. I'm not sure that is a sign of kind of backwardness, because if you think about late stage capitalism, rentierism is everywhere, right? So think about Amazon. Mm. Amazon has a platform, it captures huge profits mm. over having a monopoly on being the one place where you can get books or whatever, or all the zillions of things. Or think about Apple, all kinds of software or Microsoft. Rentierism is, pretty, is a major economic form at this moment. So are, is it correct to say indigenous peoples are backwards when they're engaging in rentierism? I mean, I, I think one could make a counter argument that would be like, when the fur trade was the biggest thing going in Canada, indigenous people were right in there doing the fur trade. Mm. Now, Canada is a late capitalist economy. Rentierism is one of the most profitable things in late capitalist economies. I, I think you're right that it is a sign of, of collapse in many mm. ways. Like I, I think the capitalist economy, when it has become a rentier economy, it's not, there's various things about it that are really not working very mm. well. And you can't sustain a rentierist economy forever. But I think by engaging in rentierism, I think they're doing something that's very modern and, and I, I think sort of sensible because the, the, the program you suggest that they should be encouraged to like engage in, in productive wage labor. Mm. I, there's not a lot of productive wage labor. I mean, good jobs of that kind are hard to come by for everybody, right? So, so there's not, Canadian cities are not full of factories that are like, we're not, we're no, kind of, none of us are in that stage of capitalism. So, so to encourage people to say like, you should become industrial wage workers, move to the city and become an industrial wage worker. Like there, those jobs aren't there. Yeah. So rentierism or even like, it's not just, it's not just indigenous people who are working for NGOs. Yeah. Did you see that recent piece about uh, like a I'm third of be there, Kathleen, because um, there's a lot on the table here and I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose the. the okay, go thread. ahead. So there's a few different things in there that I, uh, so on the one hand, there's the cultural evolution argument and the phrase, which actually is Carl Sagan. So I'm going to blame Carl Sagan for this phrase. <laughs> Hunter gatherers are the childhood of the species. Mm -hmm. That's what Sagan said. So I think, first of all, it's very important to distinguish between kind of aggregate circumstances and people themselves, because, you know, this is kind of one of the big kind of uh, problems that give you know, 
you know, like many indigenous people are completely integrated and they, they like they have maybe, uh, you know, a dream catcher on their, in their rear view mirror or whatever, but they're, 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 they're participating and they're involved in the economy. They, they might choose some traditional things, but they're, they're completely integrated. But then there's the question of like the place of Aboriginal culture very generally and it's hunting and gathering origins and so on and, 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 and how that relates to everything. Um, so with respect to the, the that, that's kind of the general argument. So like hunting and gathering is the first, the earliest stage of human development. And it, and it applies to all people, regardless of wherever they were. That's the origins of it. And that's why it's, 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 it's kind of the, seen as the first stage. And then food production. So when you actually planted things and so on, whatever that may be, that, that was kind of the, what emerged out of that. And, and then there's a number of complicating factors like pastoralism. And, and I, I find that starts to get into a little bit too complicated sort of things, but certainly hunting and gathering is, is the earliest stage. There was no human society that, was something else besides hunting and gathering. And, and in fact, animals, uh, non-human animals, they're hunters and gatherers to, to all of them are like, or whatever, or maybe they're just got, you know, grazers or whatever, but that, that's in a very general kind of sense. You mentioned teleology, which is not part of the evo cultural evolutionary schema. So there's nothing, the te teleology means there's something, and that's he basically Hegel, who is the, the main teleological thinker, and, and all religious thinkers generally are teleological, that there's something at the end that's pulling things toward it. That's not what's happening with cultural right. evolution. Cultural but evolution I mean, if you, use, if you use the metaphor of childhood, yeah. childhood is inherently tele, like there's only one place a child ends up. Right, a child ends up as an adult. So yes. if that's your metaphor, yeah, but it's um, not the adult I, that's pulling the child forward. So ch child, I, I mean, I, I, you know, so so, but that, that's a that's a big distinction because many people have accused Marx of being teleological, which I don't think is correct. Uh, what we're talking about in in historical materialism is it's like um, greater productivity of labor which is, is you can trace from increasing efficiency of technology, greater division of labor and so on, which that increasing tendency of that results in more evolved forms. So, so that's kind of the theory. Um, and looking at hunting and gathering, um, you know, you had smaller societies, less productive societies, less complex societies in hunting and gathering societies than you do when you start to produce food and you, then you move on to the industrial kinds of things much, much, much later after all sorts of developments have happened with respect to labor, technology, uh, and then to some extent, the, the, what would be considered to be the superstructure, which is the, the kind of the legal infrastructure and all these kinds of things. So, so that's, that's kind of the first thing, which I think is an important thing to stress um, then we get into the rentierism aspect of it. Uh, so this is a bit uh, complicated, but rent, rentierism or, or rent. So, so you have wage labor uh, and it doesn't have to be industrial labor, it just wage labor. So production. So the, the people who produce and then you have the people who own, the owners of the means of production who then uh, obtain profits through uh, selling products. Once, once they get the wage labor to produce the product and that product is sold for more th than what was actually paid to the workers to produce it. And that's kind of the, that's the labor theory of value. It's very, that's a very difficult kind of theory, which I, I'm very fascinating in that theory, but I, I don't have like the in-depth understanding of that to get into the nuts and bolts of it, but that's essentially what it is. So profit is what is extracted off of wage labor. So wage labor, you make profits and then you, and then the, the idea, which is why profit, and this is really in the liberal political economy kind of being, they think rent rents are very, um, it's like a, 
it's a like a a blockage or a pull on profitability so ideally like you would like to take all those profits reinvest it within the company which would then cause innovation and then that's kind of the dynamism of capitalism whereas rent is just seen as a rake off without even without doing anything without innovating without and so on so that's kind of where renterism comes from that kind of idea that you're not really contributing anything to the kind of productive enterprise through rent that that's kind of been liberal economy now of course in uh, historical materialism, it kind of doesn't look very, it, it's a little bit suspicious of that because of this idea that all value comes from labor. So therefore, why should you see profits as being this much more superior thing as opposed to rent? Like it's really labor that's the issue. Um, but in terms of like fine tuning the kind of the indigenous situation, um, the, the circumstances kind of being referred to is this kind of this kind of raking off kind of process without having any kind of contributing kind of engagement. It's almost like kind of an engagement within the system. Like you're, you're just, just raking think, off uh, this, this, uh, you know, this right, money. But I mean, there's, there's so many sectors in the contemporary economy that do that. Like why pick out, why pick out, why well, say it's bad when indigenous people do it? I mean, I think it's actually quite a reasonable economic strategy. If you think about the number of people who work in NGOs or even you and I, we yeah. live off rents, right? Like we don't. Well, we're wage, we're, we, we earn wages. So it's not rent. Where do like those rent wages, would be. Uh, no, no, we, we are rentierists because where do those wages come from? We're not, we're not factory workers. No, but you don't have anything. to be a factory. To, to, like, like rent is. is, is we're, not, totally, we're totally paid by taxes. I mean, I, I think, so that's, yeah, but, but that's just scraping I off. don't think taxes, I, I don't like, this is going to get into too fine detail of thing, but, but I'm saying you, you have a, a service that you're providing. It's not just because you happen to, to, you own the, you own the identity of Kathleen Lowry and because you own that and that you were sort of getting into that a little bit with the intellectual property rights kind of angle is you own this Kathleen Lowry identity and now people have got to pay you because of your Kathleen Lowry identity. It's that's exactly how you're in there and you're going to teach. But that's gonna, how universities work. I mean, we've monopolized you're, you're, you're credentialism. Providing, you're providing teaching. You are, you know, you're producing things. It's not a factory job and whatnot, but you're still producing things. You are educating young minds. You are exposing them to whatever. You're developing, you know, uh, thoughts about things and putting them into books and whatnot, right? And then, of course, you need to have the people who make the books and everything. But it's when it gets put into a book that it's actually can be sold. But still, there's there's in my framework anyway. There's a difference between people who are who are producing a service and get paid for that versus people who just because um, they lay claim to a waterfall or they claim lay claim to this plot of land which they've not contributed anything to it's just there there's they and haven't Francis, actually added I'm, I'm just not sure I agree like the idea that we you could produce the service like, why do you want your job back? <laughs> like you could produce the service of, of putting out ideas. The reason you want your job back is because it comes, I mean, I imagine some of like, I'm sure there's various reasons, but one of the reasons is because it comes with a salary. I, th I think that's salary. That's not I right. Mean, I think I could. Like, like I want right now, I'm, you know, this podcast is free for all you guys who are watching it there. So right. you know, you're getting, but, but no one want no one's uh no one's wanting this like you know i that would be great if, if i could get paid to, to do this podcast i, I guess i just don't see university professors and so so, so for our, example just the a spot that, in the in the okay, economic the, the structure difference, just to go back to this distinction though between um there's this plot of land that you have that you don't do anything to you just own it so you own this land because that's generally where rent came in was is that you own this land and then you you charge a capitalist to come and put their factory on that land 
who then hires the workers to produce the widgets and all the profitability. But like the, the, the sort of the liberal uh, political economists didn't like that kind of idea of this land was owned and because they saw it as being a drain off the profitability that was just going to this person sitting there doing nothing. Like they just happened to own this land. They didn't do anything to it. They didn't improve it or anything, but because they owned it purely on the basis of ownership, they were able to charge that capitalist to put their factory there and so on, right? As opposed to you going into the university, you teaching students, you are, you know, providing this service of education, all the various healthcare and things are like that, right? You're not producing widgets or whatever. It's not like a, you know, a, a hard and fast thing. That well, I don't, I mean, I think all of these right. depend on kind of um, legal, legal structures that allow you to capture which I actually think that's what universities do. I mean, we we are we are a legal structure. Something. Like if what? you own the land, you're not you're doing something. If if you own the land, you're not doing anything. It's just the fact that you own it. It's it's an ownership right. You extract things on the basis of your ownership of it. You right. But why things. why do students why do students pay to be educated by us through the university rather than just like going to the library and reading books, because at the end, because we have a kind of monopoly mm -hmm. over credentials. Yeah. I, th I think, I think um, these kind of intellectual monopolies, I think are very similar to um, monopolies in land. So I, I think the, the number of people who but are- That would just be, that would be you just then, to make the analogy, you would just, uh, students would just pay for the degree. Like, like they wouldn't be doing they, they, because they're just the credential. They pay. The, now we're entering into more. You've got the Mount Royal University medallion, and to get a you know sort of some kind of association with that, you you pay this you know a thousand dollars to Mount Royal University, and now you get this piece of paper, uh, which is whatever. And and I'm and that's a little bit fuzzy for you, but okay. So because we got five minutes left, I just want to finish off because the, okay. the, that's that's uncertain. So that's very good. Like that's kind of. These are very good kinds of, um, you know, trying to figure this out, which is which seems to me to be very complicated kind of situation. Um, then we get into the indigenous situation, which, and the question is, you know, why? What's wrong? What's what's the problem with indigenous? And this is the rent. So just by purely by some kind of ownership position, not doing anything, you extract uh, these transfers and you're not productive. It's not productive at all, what's being done. This is sort of the general kind of uh, thing. So, and in, in separate but unequal, there's basically three ways in which this is done just to have, and it's modeled on um, rentier state theory. So that's where I got the idea from, mm -hmm. which is looking at the oil states. That's where it comes. So, so the oil states are seen as being rentier states because they don't produce anything. They just get, money on the basis of having this ownership over this this very very valuable resource oil this money that is is obtained through other and it's usually other foreign companies and everything doing it that was the original thing they get this kind of transfer that goes to them and then that money is circulated amongst the population so it's what's called a circulation economy instead of a productive economy when you have actually workers that are producing things which then are are sold which which make a which are sold for a higher price which then brings profits to the the capitalist and so on and so forth so that productive that productive labor that that the, the workers are engaged in gives them power within the system because if they are if they want more wages or whatever, they can strike. So they can withdraw their labor. Uh, that that's the benefit of of labor. Right. Yeah. It? No, I I see that. I just think I actually think there's there's um this what some people call the transferiat is a huge it's it's a huge sector in the contemporary economy. So think of all the people. There was this article the other day about 
the number of NGOs in Ireland, just a mm. tremendous number of people work in NGOs. Yeah. Now you could say on the one hand, they're maybe producing something nice in some way or another, but there's, but this kind of as a gigantic sector of the economy, mm. I think is way beyond indigenous people. Mm. And I actually think it's a reasonable economic strategy mm. for indigenous communities. I don't think I actually, I think it's it's maybe less specific to indigenous people than your argument suggests. I think the well, number I don't, I don't think it's, it's just the thing about right. indigenous people, which is different is, is that that's based, well, especially these, these marginalized communities, that's the whole thing for them. So it's, it's not to say, and, and I have to think more about that. I'm uh, like, rentierism is bad. Well, that's the liberal political economy thing, because they saw it as bad because it's a, it's a drain on the Kind of I like think it, I, I actually think it is bad. I just think it is, it's a huge, it's a huge component of the contemporary economy. Like, well, this could be a late cat, like, you know, like again, um, the problem for indigenous people is, is that that's kind of the expectation as to how they're going to continue when for most people, that's not, you don't wake up and say, okay, yeah, you don't, you're not born and you say, okay, I'm going to go be an NGO, like all, all these kinds of boutique kinds of things. It's, Although, you know, I mean, that's what a lot of our universities like really do. most people, uh, who, unless they're very, you know, had these expectations from early age, you know, they're going to go and they're going to earn wages in some way, producing a service. I think there's a big difference between providing a service, which everyone needs, and just having a plot of land that you do nothing to, and because you own it, you rake off this amount. Right. Like that, those are quite different things. Um, now, it's true there might be gradations that can be explored, but with Indigenous people, because of these remote communities, um, there's no product, there's no ability to produce goods and services really for most of the people. And what they're doing is they're they're waiting around for these transfers because of various sources. And the three sources that I've identified in separate but unequal are royalties. So that's the resource resource uh, extraction, um, compensation, which is was not that big when I was first looking at this, but it's become huge now. Like we just got the boil water uh, suit. There's a lawsuit now about the, about the, the, the drinking water problem, which- right. And well, there was like the $40 billion for $40 the- billion. So like this is now snowballing because of the legal professions kind of thing. The right. problem for, is because if you're not productive, you, you don't really, have an understanding of how you fit into the system like it, it's it's kind of a very very i think corrosive it's thing. i'm not i'm not it's, actually saying that you're wrong about the rent i just think rentierism one of the things i think is interesting about the fact that this i think you're right that indigenous people are, is i think rentierism is a very general feature mm -hmm. of the contemporary economy i think there's a lot of people yeah. in the contemporary economy who are living off rents yeah. but and i guess actually to look and at I actually that, think, is that what they're doing? Like, right. to say, okay, I don't agree that um, teaching students in the university is rentierism. Now, whether you're an NGO who doesn't like whatever they're doing, like, I think still it's not rentierism. It's just a perhaps a very dubious service. <laughs> like but you have of, managed you know, to sort of capture, you know, some of the value in society to say, like, we we should have this. Yeah. Now, I, I think that you could say there's better and worse kinds of rentierism, but one of the things I think is interesting is, um, you know, intellect, all kinds of intellectual property, like what is the, the Disney company will sue your pants off yeah. if you try, because they kind of control this resource, which is like yeah. Mickey Mouse drawings mm -hmm. or whatever. So, and the, I think the Disney company can say like, oh, but we're getting a reasonable profit and we provide people with pleasure and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I think they're also scraping off, uh, uh, or maybe an even better example would be like Twitter, Facebook, all of these <laughs> new platforms that are enormously profitable yeah. that it's because you have to go to Twitter or to Facebook, like they kind of have a monopoly over social media yeah so they they they're raking off these huge yeah. profits there's a difference between monopolies profits earned from having a monopoly 
versus rentierism. Those are well, quite... I I mean maybe I, I the analyses I've seen so treat like them as rather s- the Disney cartoon, which is a good like these right, people, but monopolies complex in that way. You have a a person. So Disney had a bunch of slaves. <laughs> like this right. wasn't really known about Disney, is that you know it but was I'm... very very um you know. Uh, yeah, but you probably exploited seen... exploited all these cartoonists who it had working for it, and it got this all that. Right. And then it sold these cartoons, and then it got a profit off of that. And which but the whole the people. whole notion of monopoly rents, right? Like rents, you can you can earn a profit over and above what you should because you monopolize a certain segment. So the whole discussion yeah. of monopoly rents. Yeah. So that's I think. Yeah. So I think rentierism is a major feature of. Mm of monopolizing late 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 capitalist political economy so i actually think it's a it's a reasonable strategy i don't i don't think it's i don't think it's healthy across the economy as a whole right Mm -hmm. but i think it's not an unreasonable strategy for indigenous people to pursue and i actually think it suggests that they're quite sophisticated political economic actors that they're like, what's the best option for us? I think I think some of the stuff you say about the injustice of the way mm. those monopoly rents are distributed, I think yeah. you're right on the money about that. Yeah. Like, well, do you go uh, back to the- My disagreement with you on that would be, I think there's a difference between people who are completely integrated in the system and then choose to become rentiers in various ways because they already understand all the dynamics and everything. They're taking advantage of it. Right, as opposed to people who have not received the education and so on, the healthcare, they're isolated in these communities and they're just, you know, hoping to get some kind of piece of whatever legal kind of case has been initiated by the Aboriginal industry, uh, which is like it's kind of keeping them in this uh, sort of isolated state without very much understanding of the machinations that have gone on to enable this to occur uh, mm-hmm. but anyway yeah. well uh, well that anyway. was very interesting um yeah no i think the whole issue well, of rentierism is two hour mark so i yeah. could probably go on for another hour on the rent <laughs> right. thing alone uh, yeah. but that was very I, these are all and i'm still trying to work that out but i think that definitely um you know the kind of educational problems and so on and the, the difficulties in kind of figuring things out which i think definitely does exist like these are kind of some of the problems that. I'm well, doing. no, I think you totally have your finger on something. I would, I would, I would analyze it slightly differently, but yeah. I think you're, you've got your, you've got your finger on, yeah. on something important. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, anyway well, so uh, that was great. Um, yeah. I think we talked a lot, a lot of things that have not been talked about uh, before on the disputations, and I think we have some points of agreements and other kind of you know things that are just in the process of working out. So I wanted to thank you very much for coming right. to yeah. the thank, podcast. Um, thank you, Francis. And I, I, you know, I, I think your, your, your case is important. So I'm, I'm, yes. I'm so wishing you Hopefully, you know, well, as yeah. I said, if it doesn't get overturned, the universities are over. Uh, it really is an indication that the universities are over. So anyway, thank yeah. you very much. Okay. All right. Take care, Francis. Thanks.